I'm not sure if there are any excellencies, but all of you ex uh, excelling, uh, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, um, I would like to uh, talk to you a little bit more about the Estonia now, as that I have your attention. Uh, this morning you heard uh, uh, you heard a speech from uh, our president. Uh, so he said most of the, and he said already uh, gave you the insider perspective. So I can hardly better him. However, what I want to do then, uh, or I would like to do, is to uh, try to give maybe a little bit different uh, angle to this story or, or illustrate it with some more examples. So, um, E-Estonia, Strategic Decisions for Success, and uh, um, it's, um, once again, I like to point out we have all these nice uh, European Union flags here and uh, this is because they have supported us uh, doing this. But it is the conference. It is uh, E-Estonia we did without the European Union. We did basically most of these uh, fundamental steps uh, uh, before joining European Union and uh, maybe even despite some of their recommendations. But that is, uh, now we are living in harmony and uh, hopefully uh, have the uh, somewhat deserved leadership role in some of these issues at least. So, um, I just, uh, you know already where you came. Uh, just to remind you, um, <coughs> we are a small, cold uh, Nordic country uh, with a population of 1.4 million people. Uh, with a territory of 45,000 square kilometer. And uh, <coughs> we um, uh, are the member of European Union and NATO as of 2004. And as uh, the president said, we had this uh, independence 2.0 uh, in 1991, uh, uh, when we regained the independence from the USSR. And this year, from uh, January, we adopted the euro. Well, uh, some people say it wasn't a smart move. Uh, it certainly was an expensive move, but uh, we'll see about what it will bring to us. So um, if we talk about uh, Estonia, and uh, I'll try to do it uh, with some factual basis, uh, um, uh, I have a problem, actually, a little problem with uh, uh, with all these uh, scorecards. Uh, uh, if you look Estonia in IDI index, which is what ITU does, uh, then Estonia is on the 33rd place. Uh, well, uh, in uh, I, I like much more this global competitiveness report uh, of the, uh, Davos, uh, the World uh, Economic Forum. Uh, they have they are looking into different things. Estonia there, however, is not very high uh, up either. It's uh, well, comparatively, it's um, 26th place. Uh, um, with some individual usages, uh, I'm not sure how far it uh, you can see, but I mean, if we go to the e-government part, uh, government usage, then we are on the 12th place, uh, ranking the 150 states or so. Um, also, actually, individual usage. So, and that reflects something. I mean, Estonia uh, doesn't have maybe some of the fancy stuff you can find in other countries. Uh, but what you do find here is that people use what we have. And um, unfortunately, it's a little bit too big audience to do this kind of live demos here. Um, so I'm going to talk more and show pictures. But if you want the live demos, you can just cross the hall. On the other side, uh, people will show you how they log in, what kind of information they get, uh, what kind of other things uh, can be done. And I believe this is uh, quite interesting, and, and it is also quite widely used. We'll come to that. I'll show you some pictures. One of the, one of the things, however, Estonia, uh, well, what I do when I go to other countries, I always check uh, what is the overall in, uh, internet penetration rate. In 2011, um, this is also ITU statistics, but well, never mind. Uh, this uh, Estonia had 76%. If you compare it with other 
European countries, uh, well, uh, we are way behind Iceland or Sweden or Denmark uh, or for Finland, that matter. Uh, but we are ahead of, uh, of some other countries. So um, this is where we are. What makes it interesting to me is, and what uh, our president said this morning, uh, remember, he said, uh, especially from the beginning, we were dirt poor when we started. Usually we um, associate uh, ICTs with uh, wealthy societies. It's only the wealthy societies that can afford to buy new technology. Estonia was not wealthy. Estonia still is not wealthy, even if we sort of creep into the category of the, uh, wealthy states now. And. Um, <coughs> And according to that, I mean, when we uh, compare Estonia uh, having uh, almost the same rate of uh, internet penetration as France or Germany, then if we go on and uh, compare uh, GDP uh, per capita on the purchasing power standard, then uh, we see that Estonia is much lower, much further behind uh, than, uh, than its place would suggest. So I think Estonia in some ways is a living example of, uh, well, uh, finances matter, but uh, they are not uh, that important. So why Estonia? What is interesting in Estonia? Internet penetration rate, uh, uh, when we break it down by categories, the uh, president said it in this morning also, 98% of young people are using internet uh, intensively. This, I think, is something that actually, with all due respect to the ministers and presidents, uh, they haven't yet realized uh, in the government, or they uh, sort of know it, but they don't uh, react to it. Uh, um, uh, I think there is going to be fundamental change uh, as to how we uh, view the society, state relationships, and, uh, and it's going to happen very soon with these young people. But on the other hand, it's also a testimony that something that President uh, Ilves and uh, Minister Avix have started uh, um, uh, 60, uh, well, 14 years ago, the Tiger Leap program actually has really brought fruits. What we also have in Estonia is uh, what I like to call a fully functional e-government infrastructure, and I'll come to that. We have some seven years of experience uh, providing complex e-services to the population. Uh, we have uh, uh, some of these services widely uh, very, well, very uh, successful, like uh, uh, income tax uh, returns uh, submitted online by 92% of the cases. We have uh, internet-based voting since 2005. We have also then the dark side of cyber riots, well, or cyber war, as some say. And we are, well, lots of people don't know about Estonia. I mean, I was just uh, uh, <coughs> in one exhibition in this uh, spring, uh, and people came to e-Estonia stand and said, well, what is your company? What are you selling? And I said, well, actually, um, <coughs> we are just uh, trying to share the experience. We are not selling anything. But everybody knows Skype, not Estonia. So how did we get there? Uh, some things you heard already. Uh, well, the Tiger Leap. Uh, uh, then uh, what I think uh, I find fascinating, and people were t telling about it in this uh, e first E-Estonia session, it's, uh, <coughs> it's um, one of the best uh, public-private partnerships that I know of uh, around the world. We trained, uh, starting 2001, 2002, uh, 100,000 people in two years. 100,000 people might not uh, uh, feel like many to, to many of you, uh, but it's one-tenth of adult population uh, of Estonia. To train one-tenth of adult population without using taxpayers' money, I think, is quite remarkable. Uh, I don't think that the business people who did it really <laughs> did a charity job in this. I think that uh, when they financed it, they had very cold calculations uh, in their head uh, because they could close down the um, bank of, uh, branches, branch offices, etc. So they streamlined, uh, were able to streamline their operations and save some money. And, uh, <coughs> 
In 2009-2010, we had a similar experience uh, with another time of 100,000 people. Uh, this time, uh, people were more told to uh, how to use uh, this electronic identity, uh, how to sign digitally documents, how to vote digitally, uh, etc. So, uh, <coughs> this here is a map of Estonia. Um, as uh, I said first, Estonia has 45,000 square kilometers, 1.4 million people. It's uh, one of the least populated places in Europe. Um, there are some dots on this uh, map uh, where there are dots that are used to be public internet access points. They are still there, but uh, today it's maybe largely irrelevant because uh, you can get to internet from anywhere with uh, 3G. Um, so it's uh, and and it doesn't cost that much. I mean, it's uh, I, my monthly uh, plan with my iPad is uh, six euros, I think, unlimited access. So I. That's uh, enough for me. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, at, at one point, when we built up this information uh, society infrastructure, I think this was uh, very important that the government guaranteed and tried to help everybody who uh, showed any interest to get into Internet. Now, <clears throat> If you look at the landmarks, uh, um, I've had those up only from the 2000 on. I mean, we had uh, uh, quite uh, many important decisions before as well, but uh, let's say 2000 we started uh, actually uh, providing e-services. Uh, the electronic tax board is, uh, was launched in 2000. Uh, M parking, mobile parking. I, when I came here today, I parked my car with mobile phone. I've been doing this for 11 years. Some countries just discover it now and uh, many haven't uh, done it yet. Well, of course, it's nicer if you don't have to pay for parking, but well, that doesn't uh, happen here anymore. So uh, we, in 2003, we launched a, a bus ticket based on ID card. In 2007, we uh, launched a mobile ID that president was also talking about. In 2008, we launched the e-health system. Um, in 2005, we started with e-voting. 2002, actually, uh, the first official uh, electronic signature was exchanged between uh, the mayor of Tallinn and mayor of Tartu. So it was um, quite a landmark also. In 2007, one of the things that we are quite proud of and uh, use a lot uh, or make use of a lot is uh, e-police was uh, launched. So we have this kind of interesting uh, uh, developments. Uh, but before I ca come to that and describe a little bit of them and, uh, and uh, tr we'll try to find some maybe conclusions based on this, uh, let me just uh, um, show you something. I have to address this problem, I'm sorry. Uh, it is a question people, uh, when I talk about this, and I've been doing it um, since uh, 2001 at least, uh, uh, so it's uh, ten, the last 10 years, people tell, okay, in Estonia, yes, well, maybe you could do these things because you are such a small country that you are, um, uh, you are um, sort of an, in the neighborhood of uh, very highly developed Scandinavian countries, uh, so the knowledge transfer is easy. And that you had a very peculiar history because uh, the <coughs> The previous order had legitimized it itself. And there is truth in all of these assertions. But uh, we have uh, very good neighbors to the south uh, that are small, that share the same history and all this, uh, Latvia, Lithuania. And if you look uh, back in the history, uh, in 2000, uh, the Estonian internet penetration rate was 29%. In Latvia, it was 6%. In Lithuania, it was 6%. OK, today, uh, the development equals up. I mean, uh, with, uh, uh, the other countries are catching up, no problem. But why was Estonia so much different initially? I think, and that was one of the first questions we actually struggled in the e-governance academy when it was created uh, by the UNDP and, uh, and the Soros Foundation. So um, uh, we actually came up to the idea or conclusions that, uh, um, to put it bluntly, politics matters. The guys like uh, uh, whom you heard this morning, Thomas Ilves, uh, who was a minister of foreign affairs at the time, actually did push these things in the government. Uh, 
So we had political leadership. Politics matters. We try to be cynical today's world. We say, OK, politicians are not that important. Well, they are, and politics is. But also, uh, what is important in politics is that uh, you actually do commit resources to that. The resources Estonia committed were very small because we were a poor country. But there were always resources. We uh, found out later, there was no conscious decision, but we found out that from 1994 to 2004, every year Estonian government spent 1% of the budget uh, on ICT. So that is how we got to where we are. So there are the reasons of success. I'm not going into them at the moment. I'm rather describe you some more of it. Uh, uh, but uh, you can uh, certainly go also to the other rooms uh, again tomorrow to e-Estonia e tutorials. And uh, if you have questions, we are happy to answer in other times. But let me just uh, uh, tell you some words about the e-Estonia as a political project. It's quite interesting. I don't think we initially realized, or politicians realized, that uh, E-Estonia uh, could also provide some political capital and international political capital. Uh, they did uh, a cabinet uh, sitting without uh, papers, paperless office, uh, uh, by just wanting to, to get rid of some of the papers, having uh, to have some um, easy access to the information. And uh, they, uh, they succeeded. Um, and and uh, uh, I mean, this is uh, actual cabinet meeting in 2000 without papers anymore. This is how the room looks now. I mean, it's, um, well, nicer, but uh, the basics are the same. And there are no papers, and ministers can uh, participate in cabinet meetings, and the uh, state hasn't collapsed. In fact, it's very interesting. I remember in 2003, um, was it 2003, when Italy became the, uh, had the presidency of the EU, there was a big conference, a EU conference on uh, e-administration, and all EU ministers were uh, sitting in a podium and talking about the e-government. The Estonian Minister uh, of Economy and Communications was somehow conspicuously missing. And I went to look, where is he uh, from this hall? And uh, he was down in the back, uh, and he was uh, actually on the cabinet sitting. He said, sorry, I have some important political decisions here to make. Uh, I'll come and join these guys later. So I mean, instead of talking, they were doing. So um, what we did, what they had done, we have created e-government infrastructure. It's sort of to create access. I mean, for the citizens through the uh, uh, public internet access points, look at the world. So to the offices, we connected all local governments and government offices uh, through different programs. We digitalized information. You all have done the same. Uh, but we, what we also did, and we created this formalized ex information exchange, what we call X-Road, uh, which, by the way, is something like 80% of the cloud, uh, I mean, the definition of cloud. And we created and distributed electronic identity. In all, what we have is a, a sort of a, a society where you can put an E or something in front of anything. And uh, it is, what it means is that everything is connected. And connected not over some special channels, but uh, over the internet, just using special protocols uh, for the security reasons. So this is architecture. You can go to the, again to the next room and uh, talk to people there. They will explain how it functions. What I just want to say is that uh, because of this architecture, because of uh, uh, we can access as a citizens, these databases, but also the same, I mean, the officials can access these uh, databases. So it's kind of working. It's working since, well, the first tries were 2002. Actually, it, it became widespread in 2003. Now there are so many services. We don't count them for many years. In Estonia, it is meaningless. Three years ago, we did, uh, for secretaries generals of the different ministries, we did a training in e-governance academy. And uh, uh, in this training, uh, uh, we, well, was it our training or no? It was uh, somebody else who did the training. But anyway, uh, what happened was that uh, uh, for the <coughs> 
we ask the Secretary General, okay, uh, what kind of service would you like to see, e-service? E and they thought out uh, a service said, uh, said it, okay, we want uh, some addresses connected to something, I don't remember exactly. And then they went to have a little afternoon drink and somebody was doing the service and it was up and running in less than an hour. So that is what the e-services gives, this kind of flexibility. Um, so um, how we do it is we have to have these electronic uh, ID cards, as uh, our president was explaining to you. Um, it is not only to have them. I mean, you can purchase something. Uh, the trick is how you distribute it to the population. And then again, the trick is how you get uh, them to use it in an electronic way. Well, we have succeeded pretty well with it. Uh, um, um, I think uh, over half are now using this electronic identity, not just a physical identity on this card. Uh, so instead, <coughs> if I put it in a caricature, uh, in 1990s what we had was people just communicating with officials, officials communicating with their back offices. In uh, 2000, everybody in the world was talking about one-stop shop approach. So you just went to one official who was communicating with back offices. Well, today, <coughs> and what we did in Estonia, we had always a dream. <coughs> we had a person directly communicating with back offices, without uh, officials. It doesn't mean that officials disappear. No, they have much more interesting jobs uh, henceforth because uh, they can now actually design policies instead of pushing papers back and forth. So what we have as a uh, sort of result, uh, see electronic registries of company, new company 18 minutes, well who wants to do it in 18 minutes, you want to think about it. Uh, it took me about two hours to create a company for my wife, uh, but well. Um, so uh, uh, you see the, this is a paper trail. I mean, uh, the people who use paper-based registration, uh, this is uh, what uh, people do it electronically. You see uh, quite convincingly how people are reacting. Um, some things that were, and it's very easily explainable, some things that was taking five days before is taking a rather shorter version today. Uh, the same you can see <coughs> how to buy land in Estonia. Again, you see, these services are rather popular. What is also very interesting, uh, um, <coughs> and the uh, president said a little bit about it, is a privacy by design. Uh, the digital case file of the me medical case file, uh, digital prescription things, are very, very good examples. And I actually re uh, uh, encourage you, we, we are not speaking about uh, e-health uh, in the main uh, program that much, but there is a sponsored session tomorrow at 5, 15 hours who is interested in Allegro, uh, where people people are talking a lot about it. Uh, also in the e-citizen uh, section tomorrow in e-Estonia there is a lot to talk about it. But what does it mean? What do they have? What is there to be learned? It is um, uh, the technology today allows us uh, to give the right to decide about our information uh, to the people themselves, to data subjects. So it's not uh, by the goodness of the heart of the government that uh, uh, our data is protected. No, it is our decisions, how much we want to protect it. For example, I'm happy to share my data, so I have uh, uh, left many of these options open, but you can, if you want to be secretive, close your data. So it's much of uh, your decision. And uh, you can also delegate things. What is, uh, I can, for example, give the right to, uh, to take my prescription drugs to my uh, cleaning lady if I'm uh, sort of sick at home and I don't want to go to the drugstore. I just enter the data in, in, uh, uh, over, over internet uh, and, and my cleaning lady can pick up my prescription drugs. So, I mean, there are lots of these kind of things uh, uh, what empowers people uh, what, uh, and uh, it uh, at the end gets me a better service. <coughs> so there are uh, things that you can see the coming of uh, new types of e-government uh, 24-7 government, do-it-yourself government, also mobile government. Uh, uh, it's very interesting also uh, integration of different user roles in the government gateway. 
Um, <clears throat> and at the end, we get to uh, see what is uh, this is the declaration submitted. In 2000, we started with 9%, now we have a 92%. What it also shows, however, is that uh, if you embark on this road, it's actually quite a long road before you actually can take credit for it. Usually, the political life cycle is four years. So, uh, and this is a process of 10 years. This is uh, one of these kind of complex e-services, parental leave benefit. You get from many different databases, um, <coughs> sorry, information, uh, <coughs> and then um, the government will provide you uh, some income after your child is born. Now, uh, it used to be running around uh, uh, to five different offices, getting six or seven papers, seven documents in real life. Today, it's three minutes uh, um, data input. Now, what is interesting with this and what is interesting about Estonia is that uh, even this kind of killer applications where it's really logical that you would use it, you actually don't see it. This is an uh, uh, introduction of, uh, of this parental leave benefit. We started in 2005 and, uh, <coughs> I mean, you know, guys, uh, who is giving birth? These are young people usually, not old people. So we know young people under 35, everybody is using internet, 98%. So why is it only that one third of them is using electronic systems? We are much more conservative, actually, than we like to think we are. I mean, we're using internet for uh, reading newspapers, but not necessarily by, <coughs> by applying for services. However, I think uh, there are also other lessons, and that's why Estonia is really interesting. You have these lessons. You don't see much of it because uh, if you're just looking from outside world and trying to evaluate how many services there are for Estonians, well, if you don't have ID card, you don't see them because it is all behind the protected wall. That's why we are on the 33rd place on IDI index or something like that. So, <coughs> um, well, um, basically I, I, I want to conclude here and uh, maybe to listen to you, uh, your interest. To, we have a distinguished panel here. These people have all had uh, uh, dealings with e-Estonia or Estonia. And uh, they, uh, well, they have heard me before, I'm afraid to say, but at least most of them. Um, and uh, we, we get some of their perspective, but I encourage you to uh, also provide the perspective. I'm not going to go into the philosophical details. We heard that uh, in the morning, but basically what I want to say is that uh, we are changing the labels quite a lot. We started in 1990s with information societies, and we went to paperless office, online government, e-government, m-government, e-governance. We returned to good governance. I've, I think we have stayed in good governance track. I think it's very good, actually, that we've stayed there. Uh, and what we see now in real life is that uh, this good government, this e-governance introduction is going deeper and it's going uh, broader. So uh, uh, this is what is happening. Um, well, uh, um, to conclude, then, we are in the new reality where ICT usage is not a hobby, not a tool, but a major building block of that reality. And the reality has already changed, but our minds have not recognized it yet. And uh, we need to work on these new fundamentals and not just sharpening our knives and swords and uh, thinking about the paper solutions or uh, desiring them back. They are not coming back in this way. Thank you very much. Um, If you, want, if you want to learn about the Estonia, there is, oops, why did it go back? Uh, I wanted to show this. Uh, we, uh, we created a website, um, launched it about uh, two months ago. And uh, uh, there you find a lot of uh, stories about the Estonia, uh, about the descriptions of these different components. What is interesting with the Estonia, really, if I compare with my notes uh, that I've uh, been doing, uh, going from one country to another, uh, Estonia <coughs> is created by private sector. It is well. It is the government things that are uh, uh, created by the private sector. Government offices are very small. Uh, the uh, e-government office or the state information systems uh, uh, office in the Ministry of Economic Affairs. I'm afraid to say you are going to laugh. It's nine people. 
I mean, government in Estonia, in that sense, is uh, acting as a smart purchaser. The solutions down to this e-cabinet solution, they are created by private sector. For a long time, Estonian private sector was looking inside and say, well, they were quite happy with what they were doing, but they weren't really looking out. Now they are um, eagerly here, and I think uh, they have something to contribute. And uh, uh, if you have a chance to talk to them, I, I think uh, you should take it. And this is something that they sort of help to create this kind of e-Estonia uh, tool where uh, you, you can find a lot of information. So, thanks. <laughs> now I will uh, give the floor to Yuri Misnikov, um, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, he was one of the guys who started uh, uh, e-governance academy, actually, in 2002 when he was working for the United Nations Development Program. And uh, uh, let me just uh, int <coughs> jump ahead also. Uh, the first chairman of the E-Governance Academy Foundation's board was uh, Jerzy Czelichowski, sitting also at this table. So you have some of the people who have had long history with E-Estonia, some others who have had less, but uh, I think their perspective is interesting in any case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibar. Does it work? Does it? Okay. Thank you very much for your story, and the story is told uh, quite interesting story, and this is we gathered here so that to discuss this story. But let me first uh, tell my story, maybe even three stories. And uh, one of the story was quite uh, happened quite long ago, and that was uh, in probably in 2003 during the summit on the Information Society in Geneva, when uh, there was a stand of newly created Egans Academy with some initial success stories, and uh, my former boss at that time, head of UNDP, uh, Mark Mal Brown, uh, said that uh, after visiting the stand, saying, well, if uh, Estonia has not existed, it should probably have to be invented, <laughs> because it, it really sounded uh, naturally and well Estonia. But, uh, you know, there is... Uh, Sort of a joke, but in every joke there is a lot of truth. Another story has been has happened just today, and I've been sitting having lunch with uh, sort of my good friend. Uh, been working a lot in the Western Balkans, uh, Nerena Rechic, uh, who's driving force uh, behind the uh, Electronic South Eastern Europe Initiative, and she was asking, so what's behind that uh, success of Estonia? Why it so happened? And this is what Ivor has been telling all us. And uh, interesting that I. Uh, reflected along the same lines, talking about sort of consensus, solidarity, of course, right people at the right time, and even was among themselves, and role of, of political leaders like President Ilves today. So there are, of course, uh, some very concrete and very sort of tangible ingredients in, in, in that success story. But at the same time, of course, uh, everyone is asking their own questions, so whether it's applicable to, to my own country, whether it's, uh, it can be adapted or adopted or can be emulated. And it, that this is a very difficult question. I think that all the sessions will be looking at those issues in more specific ways and in, in more specific areas. What uh, I, I would like to tell simply that uh, my sort of last uh, story for today that I remember reading one of the e government uh, uh, reports issued by the Accenture. And uh, now what struck me at that time that uh, now all those interviewed leaders, executives, both in business and uh, also in, 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 in government, they were saying that they're very curious what others are doing, what other businesses, uh, executives are doing, what other governments are doing. So I think that the, for particularly this area, which is new, innovative, everyone is curious what the neighbors are doing, what other countries are doing, so that to compare, to benchmark, to see what can be done, whether we're moving in that right direction, and so on. So, and this is why we sort of today here, we've, we, we've got uh, 
uh, five uh, experts which represent both uh, specific countries, institutions, and even regions uh, who uh, will not be making lengthy presentations as normally we do. There will be no PowerPoint presentation. There will be more talk, and I would like that the audience would be involved and engaged in discussing issues. But before, of course, uh, uh, I would like to introduce those who will reflect on what uh, Ivor has said, and uh, maybe what I have been saying to, so that to look at uh, uh, some of the issues which are, uh, are uh, uh, important for us today. So Ivor introduced Jerzy Celichowski sitting uh, uh, clockwise, if looking. Uh, then uh, Jeremy Miller, who represents uh, the Danish uh, Technological Institute, uh, says, if I'm correct, and Jeremy has a vast experience in working and reviewing developing programs for the European Union, the UN, and specific countries. So he, and then uh, you probably, many of you have attended the exciting talk by Phil Noble, also our good friend, about uh, uh, how things done in the United States in politics. I think what is important that, uh, that Phil underlined the importance of politics, and this is what Ever has been saying, so politics should not be neglected. Probably it's uh, important significance just growing. So Phil will also provide his insights. Uh, then we have also uh, uh, Majid Laboudi, who from, I understand from Sudan, but he has extensive experience uh, of uh, the Middle East in general, but also in Estonia, independent expert. But uh, he's been working uh, also, f as far as I understand, for HP. So he has sort of technological experience uh, of a major technological company. And we have also uh, Artom Yermolaev, who is the minister of the uh, Moscow government. And at the same time, he's head of the IT department in charge, effectively, of uh, all uh, innovations, which uh, we probably also would like to hear from him and uh, uh, compare how it uh, uh, can be uh, done in terms of knowledge exchange and experiences. So what I would like to do, there, was, there is no order in terms of speaking. I think that you can take your liberty and speak up. Uh, but uh, what I would like you to ask, and also then the audience, so if you can highlight one, two, or three major achievements which have been uh, described by Ivor and, 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 and just comment on that, whether you, what you believe is most important and can be shared on a wider scale. And also maybe something has been missed by Estonia. So they haven't done, of course they couldn't done everything. So that will be also valuable vice versa to the, uh, uh, to the country itself. So let's just have this talk and uh, I'd like to give the floor to anyone who is the brave. Jeremy? Okay, I'm always brave <coughs> and going first. Um, that means you'll forget what I've said by the time the others have uh, <laughs> talked. Uh, I think I've, what I've heard, is it not working? Is that better? Yeah, okay. Now what I've heard today, I think it, sh it reinforces for me the importance of clever and far-sighted people, actually, and that's clearly the case in Estonia, but also the importance of people who implement it in a clever and smart and far-sighted way as well. It's really down to people. And I, uh, I'm a Brit living in Denmark, so I, I know a little bit, but not enough about both countries. So I apologize to the Danes and the Brits here. <laughs> but uh, I think if I go back to what uh, Ivor was saying about the early uh, stages, I can recognize that both in Denmark and the UK. In Denmark, when I arrived in Denmark in, two th in uh, the 1980s, they had already implemented the world's first telecottages, telecenters. Uh, in, in rural areas, peripheral areas. They had about 13 <coughs> of them. It was to compensate the peripheral areas for not having a motorway. And this was when I, the days of ISDN and everybody was waving their arms around uh, about this new technology. So they got these 13 telecenters. And within 10 years, they, would all, they had all been closed down. But the reason was they were very successful because what they did, they trained particularly companies but also people, showed them what the technology was doing, how to use it, and that they should get hold of this stuff themselves. Um, Denmark's a small country, 13, uh, wasn't, wasn't very many. In the UK, something similar happened, and they went really crazy for this telecottage idea, for training, skills, and access. Basically, those are the three key in the early days. They had over 300 of these telecenters. 
And I'm not actually quite sure how many are left now. Not, not too many, I think. Um, so basically, the early focus was very much on access and skills. And I think I saw that in <coughs> Estonia as well. But then, in a sense, I think uh, Denmark and the UK differed because in, the, in Denmark, um, there was good political will and also some coordination, but it was quite decentralized, not just to different parts of the country, but down to the ministries and agencies. But very, very strong and good, flexible coordination with a task force. And that's been very successful. The main focus, I think, has been on implementation and management and coordination and processes. Very successful. Putting policies into practice, but in a flexible way. The UK went a different route. They had very, very strong top-down policies, which were su successful for five years. But then they forgot a little bit about the implementation and the skills and the follow-through on the ground. And then they started to lose... Uh, their momentum and were perhaps less successful than Denmark has been. For example, they outsourced lots and lots of big IT projects to large uh, IT companies and, and didn't really have a good system for contracting and supervising those contracts and have lost huge amounts of money. Just last week, the big uh, National Health Service backbone was finally closed down, not succeeding many, many years out of uh, behind schedule. Four, four or five times over budget and still hasn't been su successful and that had to close down. So I think the, the, the s lesson for me in that is that uh, you do need good policies and political will but you also need good implementation, good people on the ground in the ministries and the agencies and the regions to implement it, you know, who know what they're doing. Middle management I think is key in this as well. Uh, and, and finally, we see this also in the financial crisis in, uh, now, which is no one has seems to have mentioned this very much. <coughs> Maybe it's not important in Estonia, but in, in many countries, the financial crisis is really important in relation to rolling out e-government. In, in Denmark, it has meant that everything is now about saving money, cost-cutting, mm. uh, because the only way you can invest in the technology and the people for e-government is basically to say that it actually brings you benefits on the bottom line, benefits for the government, of course. So there's a strong, very strong move to self-service. Everything must be self-service. Moving citizens uh, away from face-to-face -to -face towards um, uh, online services, away from telephone. Um, so basically moving everybody to the online channel. And it's a similar thing in the UK, of course. So they're both, in, in a sense, coming together there. But, but the, the jury is still out on those developments, I guess. So uh, I think Denmark will probably be more successful than the UK. So those are some of the general lessons, I think. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I recall um, buying foodstuffs from Tesco or Asda in the UK, and mm. you, know, you have to check out yourself, so self-service. Yeah, so that's yeah. probably what government is doing. So I thought, well, if I'm doing that myself, I should be paid by Tesco <coughs> probably. <laughs> no, vice versa. So yeah. maybe that the way that the government is doing, everyone will be doing self-service. So anyone next? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I, I have Still been coming to Estonia since, I guess, about 1997, off and on, more off than on of late. But I think there are three things that, to me, are, are the keystones. And I think first is Estonia developed the E-everything out of their own sort of distinctive character. This is an unusual country. I mean, it's got an unusual history. It's got uh, unusual geography. And, and I think there was a sense of independence and a willingness to, f to follow their instincts in doing something new and different and untested, but very much related to their character and who they were. And I, and I think if you look around other places where, where ICTs have really worked, it's, it's because they reflected the character of the country in some way, in, in terms of their history and resources and so on. So I, I think that's first. The second is there has been a long-term consistent vision and, and really smart leadership on this. I mean, I, when I first came here in 97, the Tiger Leap was first beginning. 
but you, but they were already talking about stage two and three and four. Uh, th that commitment over time hasn't changed. And, and, and in a political world where we make a new decision every 15 minutes based on a poll, that has been really vital, I think, for this country. They have, they have kept the faith, so to speak, for a long time in a very difficult environment. <clears throat> and, and the third thing, and I, I know I'm going to embarrass people, but there have been people here, like that guy sitting over there who was talking a while ago, and this one here, who have been doing this for God knows how long. Too long, probably. But, but, but they have been the consistent. It hasn't just been the politicians giving lip service. It's been the people on the ground every day um, who, who made the e-governance academy happen, who made it work, and who have made it a unique entity in our global e-community. And I think that they are literally the ones responsible for the long-term success. Politicians come and go. Uh, a willpower helps to have it articulated at the top, but it is the on-the-ground level leadership that this country's had, in my opinion, that has been the single fundamental difference uh, over time. So thank you for what y'all did. Thank you. And are doing. Thank you, Phil. So, Jerzy, so it's, you would like to speak? Yeah. I would also like to start with a story. <clears throat> 10 years ago, I was a student at the London School of Economics and I decided to write a dissertation about Estonia, as I found this country interesting. And I wrote to a number of people in Estonia, asking them for an interview. I decided to come and talk to them with their too little written material about the country. <clears throat> and one of them was Thomas Hendrik Ilves, who was the foreign minister then, but who was known for having started the, the Tiger Leap project. And lo and behold, I received promptly response from the ministry. He was ready to meet me, he, to meet a graduate student, just like that. And he, I met him, he was late for a meeting, but he was late for his next meeting because he became so excited talking to me about these issues <coughs> that he was simply ran over time. Uh, and my experience was that these were <coughs> all very, very passionate people, very open people. Uh, and the country clearly was becoming e-Estonia, not just because they were clever with using technology, but were doing things differently. Uh, you remember 10 years ago, <coughs> we're talking much more about transition from, from socialism, communism, whatever you name it. And Estonia, 20 years ago, was on par with countries like Turkmenistan or Uzbekistan. It was a former Soviet Republic. We tend to forget about this, but the starting point was similar. <coughs> there were differences, of course, but they, they made much more out of this. And if you compare it to the Baltic states, they also, as Eva quoted some statistics, <coughs> they took some different decisions. I think the most important one was that they elected very young leaders. Unlike Estonia, sorry, unlike Lithuania or Latvia, <coughs> they, uh, the leadership in the first years of, of independence was very, very young. And these young people introduced different culture of doing things, different <coughs> way the country was running. I have a friend who calls, he, I think he's here possibly, uh, so it's a, a friend from Britain who lives here because he likes it. He says the country feels like a giant startup in a very positive, positive way. <clears throat> now, I work for Open Society Foundations, and we, uh, our main overarching theme is human rights. Um, what, is <clears throat> what I'm interested in, and this is maybe a little bit of challenge to, to, to Ivar and, and colleagues working here, is <clears throat> how cyber rights are uh, kept in, in Estonia. I mean here things like access to information, freedom of speech, or privacy. I know that Estonia is doing very well uh, as in Freedom House uh, comparison. But I think that equally as, as advertising particular services or, or backbone solutions, uh, you should be promoting here particular policy solutions that would affect not only the government but also companies and, and uh, work with individuals, particularly privacy is a very subtle area. <clears throat> and working and struggling to be number one country that preserves this cyber liberties best. But people this is the country that said that access to the internet is a human right. 
Um, <clears throat> think of other things. We were champions of, of privacy. We were the best country for, for in this, this respect. Uh, <clears throat> and the very last point I would like to make is that <clears throat> as a person who grew up in socialism, and if you uh, probably lo lots of you have this experience, is socialism means queuing. You have to spend a lot of time queuing to buy things. <clears throat> what, what is very little uh, spoken about, but this e-governance things, if done well, they give you back dignity. Queuing is humiliating. Uh, it, it's really bad. It, is the f it deprives you of dignity. And this gives you back. You, you again are treated properly. You again are treated as a human. So this is very well done. Thank you very much, Jerzy, for interesting complimentary <laughs> suggestions to known successes. But of course, we know that not everything can be done. And, and that's quite interesting communication rights and, and right, cyber rights are something which uh, is on the agenda and probably Estonia and the Gans Academy could, could, could do in my, in my view. So who's... Yeah, I'll continue. Tom? Yeah. Um, I've been born in USSR, which had been mentioned a lot this time. Um, and um, I thought I can say that we really miss this republic, which, uh, I mean, Estonia, uh, from one side. Uh, from another side, uh, it is good that you guys uh, decided to go because uh, now we can test on you. I mean, you, you tested a lot, uh, the e-government, how it works. You're a little bit smaller than we are and it's easier to implement and we take the best of uh, you create and uh, many thanks for that because now <coughs> starting from uh, X road, we do implement in Russia because uh, we thought how it works. Uh, we understand the case study and we implement it and uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for the mobile ID because we do think and understand that's the way to go. And uh, we even uh, uh, enforce that. I mean, uh, we try to take the best solution that you create. Uh, and we really expect that you guys will implement this uh, e-government in European Union. Because uh, the issues we are facing now in the Russian Federation with the e-government, that uh, we being as a federation, we consist of 83 regions, which are absolutely different. For example, in, in Moscow we have um, officially 11 million people, but unofficially it's close to 16 or 17 million. We have a uh, really comprehensive transportation system, which consists of uh, underground, uh, the, the, the buses, the, the railways, and etc., etc. But in some regions we have transportation based on camels. And, or uh, on the beers or something like that and and the payment for the transportation differs so and when we need to create as you called it e-ticket or e-bus system yeah you need to take into consideration that uh, they are absolutely different in the different regions and you need to create the roaming through these regions so and we think that and we really want uh, to see how you will go further with your solutions in the euro because you will unite through your systems, or will try to unite um, the different political system, the different uh, mentality systems, and the different business process systems. And we want to understand how to do that, because it's easier, much easier to do that in, in Moscow. We, we are, again, doing that. But to uh, unite Moscow and St. Petersburg in one system, is, is, it, it is a challenge. And uh, we want, experience, uh, we want uh, to exchange experience in that theme. And, um, so once again, thanks for, for the technology you're giving us, which we're trying to implement. Uh, thanks for being peer pioneers, and uh, we do expect uh, your success in, uh, in uh, uniting different countries, uh, because that we, we, we do really need. Thanks for that. Thank you, Artyom. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a challenge you know, to, to deploy the effective system for, for such a huge uh, metropolis as, as Moscow is and, and possibly benefits also could be huge when it is done and, and uh, this is what, what you're doing. Now, maybe you can discuss that uh, later. There are some other countries also which in big cities and huge countries. What, what are the challenges? I think that this is something interesting. We continue this discussion. So, so small Estonia, so it's easy done, but maybe it's not so easily can be done and, and uh, definitely might be more difficult in, in bigger countries, but still uh, for me it's not very clear what exactly is more difficult there. So now, uh, Ajit, your turn, please. Thank you. Uh, 
First of all, I'm not a government official. Uh, I'm not any guy who was in IT. Uh, I'm a guy who was fascinated by technology. And uh, the first time I came to Estonia was in the late 90s. And uh, I discovered that Estonia was, has invented the first social network, Kaza. I, I want to see how many are over 45. Who remembers Kaza? Oh my goodness, okay. So Kaza was the first social network which was done worldwide. And nobody mentioned it today, not His Excellency the President, not Ivar, not everybody. And I was just like waiting. Why? That's the first social network. And that's what inter-exchange of media files. We all know the story of Kaza and how it started and how it finished as well. Finished, practically speaking, because there was no regulation at the time. And there is still no regulation on the media exchange until now. But for me, Estonia was the first social network creator. And then after that, boom, Skype. Wow. Who's these people? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy from Africa. I'm half African, half Asian. Uh, so I was fascinated by this technology. So I came to Estonia, started visiting companies here. And then I started finding niches. People who actually started to build their e-government. Not only that, uh, they've gone a step further without knowing. Uh, they created an open source at the time. Nobody knew what open source is. But they didn't have money to buy licenses. They didn't have any uh, money to expend in, in, in IT. And they've actually automated their stock exchange. So I managed to take that solution. And uh, I went to one of the most beautiful place, the Caribbeans, uh, Bahamas, uh, uh, Kingston Town, Jamaica. They're all running. Their stock exchanges are running on Estonian solution. And I said, wow, uh, this is easy. Uh, let me take them somewhere else. So uh, I started to venture in East Europe, the south side of it, uh, Moldova, uh, 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 Serbia. Montenegro, and I started to venture also with Estonians in uh, Africa. Uh, right now, uh, what I call the unknown soldier, or Estonians, are building the whole public finance of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the bigger countries in Africa. Uh, I took them to the Middle East, the Gulf countries. Uh, one of the Gulf countries actually have their government portal not functioning. Uh, Estonian was, were there, and in a matter of few months, portal was up, services was up, and that country actually won the best content portal in the Middle East. Uh, so uh, we, are, we opened offices in Oman, in Qatar, in Egypt. And so nobody knows Estonia. They are, they are the unknown soldiers. Uh, why Estonia? I found out that, first of all, I have to give credit to everybody. After the Soviet Union, Estonia has inherited a fantastic education background, especially when it comes to mathematics. Uh, University of Tartu, uh, all universities here concentrated on mathematics and produce good people. People who can think, people who can actually uh, produce. Uh, so. I found out also that because these people have no financial capabilities, open source is the way. And we started implementing that five, ten years ago in many places. Oh, sorry, uh, well, I would say six years ago in many places. Uh, all our solutions which are Im implementing outside in, in Africa, in the Middle East, it's all based on open sources. No licenses. And this is what Africa needs, and that's what the Middle East needs. That's what the third world needs. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody. I mean, I don't like to pay licenses. Uh, I don't like, for example, uh, for, I'll just give you an example. <coughs> I was talking to uh, a colleague of mine and a friend of mine uh, who actually implemented a solution for national registry. And every time uh, a birth is taking care in that country, they have to pay a license because that's a new user. And the license is $500 uh, dollars for the new user. 
And this country have like half a million people born every year. So, I mean, it is incredible. With that money of licenses alone, I can actually ignite the whole country, ignite the whole e-government. So uh, this is where we are pushing, and, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, Africa, where most of the big companies were you know, dominating, now this is getting out of the window. And uh, the thing is, why Estonia, again, because Estonia concentrated on open licenses, sometimes poor can be beautiful, because they actually managed to uh, build IP, intellectual property, that is usable, and uh, that is also very cheap and affordable. Not only that, the idea of uh, taking the Estonian IT industry out is not actually to implement project, but we are building industries. Because everywhere we go, people are saying, okay, open source, it's cheap, but how can you support it? We don't know anything about it. Uh, we cannot support it. We don't know anything about IT. So we started building the supports, and that's why we have many offices now actually manned by Estonians around Africa and the Middle East, uh, whereby we are transferring knowledge on support, on coding, on everything. So really going out in support of knowledge. So Estonia is not implementing solutions outside. Actually, they are building industry. And um, I always call them the unknown soldier of IT. Um, I see uh, a great nation. Um, the only problem we have here I started running out of resources. There are not enough people to take abroad anymore. And that is a problem. So, and I, I was also shocked today when His Excellency, the President, says that the birth rate here is negative. You know, so, no, that's not good. You know, so uh, this is my experience with Estonia. It might be a little bit boring for you, but uh, it's, it's a passion of a life here, which I've been since... Uh, a decade working in this country, working with people from this country, working with different companies, different technologies, and uh, I am proud to be here talking about them. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Majid. And thank you so much to all the presenters. Uh, we've heard that uh, uh, what is important uh, for success is consistency, political leadership is important. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, there are some other issues, as just as uh, mentioned, the issue of, of cyber rights, which is a new one. Then we've heard the importance of uh, intellectual property rights, but from perspective that open source, open standards have to be promoted. That's the view, and uh, I just want to remind that the well-known Estonian ID card is based on open standards, so it's done, and then we've heard that uh, uh, mm, size matters, that of course uh, larger cities are, are in larger cities difficult to implement, but at the same time I'm glad to learn that uh, uh, Moscow government is using technology which have been proven here and successful. But now I'd like the audience to reflect on all that and maybe I've just brought other issues. I would like now that you would highlight the problems which your countries experience, so your companies or your organizations you're working for. So we've heard a lot about successes of Estonia and, uh, uh, and, and what needs to be done. I think it's important also for, for all who work here in Estonia so that to see how they can uh, adjust and tailor-made their programs, their training programs. Estonia Gowns Academy has extensive training program and for example they possibly could be new training courses, new cooperation projects. So just please uh, raise your hand. There are uh, 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 ladies in orange carrot <laughs> uh, color jackets which will give you the phone and you just can speak. Okay. My name is Asomidin Atoyev. I'm from Tajikistan. Uh, Majid already uh, partly answered my question. My question would be to my uh, Estonian colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> as today was also mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. President mentioned about building on the ruins of USSR and poverty that inherited. What would uh, you advise to your former compatriots uh, to my, I mean, uh, f uh, countries of Soviet, former countries of USSR, particularly Central Asian countries, what you, would you s uh, recommend to keep 
a few a few things inherited from Soviet, uh, from USSR, from Soviet time, uh, and uh, this is uh, if if there is any if there is any anything that would would recommend. And the second question would be, uh, I hope you don't mind if I compare your country with uh, Singapore. Uh, recently, we had a conference call, thanks to Waldman's support, with the Singapore. And my question was to Singaporean, what was the main driving force for them uh, to build <coughs> such a e uh, society, advanced e society? And the answer was survival. Survival made them to build that uh, country, Singapore, that we have now. What was you, your driving force? Uh, if my understanding is that it is also the same, the same uh, reason as for Singaporean, it is survival. I mean, these two questions. Thank you. Okay, it's working again. Um, so if I uh, answer quickly, well, the second question, actually, the president answered this, and he said that, well, it is survival in a sense that uh, if you are very small, then you need to uh, need to find very efficient ways of uh, doing things. And I think he had a very good comparison in the morning. Uh, I hadn't thought in, in that terms. I mean, that numerical versus functional sort of greatness. Um, um, but um, as to Singapore, we don't mind to be compared to Singapore. It's just uh, if you compare us, uh, we don't have uh, paper checks uh, uh, with banking. Uh, half of Singapore is using them, half of using uh, uh, some kind of electronic banking. In Estonia, it's 98% electronic banking. So uh, we don't mind to be compared to Singapore at all. Um, <coughs> Now, um, sorry, the first question was what to, to recommend about the poverty. Well, uh, see, the thing uh, really that uh, uh, strikes me, or what, what is uh, our le uh, sort of lessons uh, from this tiger leap. I mean, if or when we started uh, in '96, uh, connecting the schools, putting computers into schools, um, remember that uh, like 15 years ago, the computers costed uh, on average $1,000 a piece. A teacher's salary in Estonia at that time was about $100 a month. So uh, there was actually, it wasn't so rosy as President said, that the teachers kind of uh, liked and then everybody else was envious and, uh, and uh, wanted to get them as well. That was part of it, but uh, uh, major uh, sort of driving force, uh, or well, ma major reaction from the teachers was, uh, look, this is so expensive. If you have so much money, why don't you um, repair the school roofs? Uh, if you have money over, why don't you raise my salary so that I will be a bit more happier to go to, uh, to school and teach as children? And it was a kind of uh, boldness uh, of political leaders to say, no, you'll get to that, but first we'll do the computers and the internet. And, uh, and it has paid us off. Uh, you know, in social sciences, there is this kind of terminology. People speak about the vicious circle of poverty. People end up very much in the same social strata where they started with, like 90% of people usually do. I think that uh, what we did with the Tiger Leap uh, in the uh, 1990s was actually taking Estonia out of this poverty loop. I mean, I, I remember coming back from McGill uh, and starting to teach at Tartu University, and I had gloves on because uh, the heating was so low. My salary, uh, the Estonian salary, I'm sorry to say, was about uh, $80 a month, maybe. That's a, that's a university lecturer salary. Well, I was fortunate enough uh, to get uh, support from Soros Foundation uh, uh, to afford to teach here. Uh, but uh, but that was the reality 15 years ago. So we weren't that much different. Yes, uh, different from you. Uh, so it's possible to get out. You just have to will it. Thank you. Thank you. Any quick comments from uh, presenters? Or answers? No. All right. So any questions, please? Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Ruankanji Ronald. I'm from Uganda. Um, from the president's speech in the morning and also from this session, it appears to me that leadership and political 
a will is very important in order for us to move a long way in e government. Now, I'm just curious to know where does this leadership and political will come from? Yeah. Where is the source of this political will? Is it because of the civil society pushing the government, pushing the leaders, or where does it come from? Yeah, Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, you have a, back in Uganda a political leadership who is willing to go, and I'll tell you how it happened in Uganda. Because also I've worked in Uganda in the public finance, actually we automated the Ministry of Finance, the national budget in Uganda. And it is one of the most successful implementation of e-government or public finance project in the whole of Africa, funded by the World Bank. And until now, whenever you go and sit in a meeting in the World Bank, they brag about the Ugandan implementation. You know, so it is a flower in the uh, World Bank jacket. Leadership, how it happened. Uh, I lived it uh, in Uganda. Uh, practically speaking, it was very high corruption rates. Uh, there was a huge amount of what we used to call uh, ghost employees in government ministries. Um, um, it's not only the corruption, it's the corruption. There was no transparency, there was nothing. And uh, by the time uh, this started to deplete the national budget, and people suddenly woke up and they said they have to put a stop to this. And this is when leadership started to happen. And I think it is because of the next generation. The next generation of Uganda, just for an example, is practically speaking people who have had uh, better education and uh, people who have exposure into Europe in terms of the education. And these people came out talking about transparency, uh, poverty alleviation, and so forth. So leadership in every country happens differently. It depends on the country. In, for example, in Tajikistan, it will be a totally different story. Uh, in Tajikistan, for example, for a fact, I know, they have problems in distributing pension funds. And they still, still have the old sub banks they're trying to, you know, and I was there in Tajik, actually. And I've, I've looked at the leadership there and how the leadership is. So the level of leadership in every country is totally different. It depends on the situation. It depends on the circumstances. That's how you build the leadership. Jeremy? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Just one comment. About the, uh, the UK, which has been a leader in, in, in uh, e-government. I mean, it's, a, it's a funny, but it's a true story. About, uh, about two years ago, Gordon Brown, if you remember him, he was the prime minister who inherited it from Blair. He could see, and this was after the financial crash, he could see that things were going bad, basically very bad, and he was going to lose the next election. So he said, who's one of the most respected people in, uh, out there in the internet world? Tim Berners-Lee, the so-called father of the internet. So they had a meeting at Downing Street and, and said, what can I do to you know, get, improve my popularity? So Tim Berners-Lee had said, well, the most important thing to do is to put all the government, the public sector data online and then let people start playing with it and using it. And this was even before Obama did it, all right? But it, the policy came later. And now we look back at Gordon Brown's tenureship of, of, uh, of, of the UK in very negative terms. But we, people in the know, we, we recognize that. So you're quite right. It depends a lot on the country. In this case, it was a, a visionary leader, but also a pragmatic leader. He wanted something to be remembered by, basically. <laughs> and that, that's what it boiled down to. Just one, just one uh, quick comment. I know... Uh, you talked about no one wants to stand in a queue, and you're right in some ways. But I did some research a few years ago um, ab about old old people who were internet, so we digitally literate, why they weren't going online to collect their uh, pension and to do their other uh, official business, and they they were perfectly capable of doing it, and we just didn't understand why they weren't going online, or some of them anyway. So we asked them. One of the old ladies we talked to said, well, if I do it online, I never meet anybody. If I go and stand in the post office, I've got people next to me, and I can talk to the cashier. Actually, we, off we should not forget that doing everything online may not always be the best solution, depending on who the people are. Right? So that's a, a, that really taught me a lot of lessons. And I think we should, when we're <coughs> moving strongly towards e-government solutions, we should remember that there are other channels 
and many people in society have different needs, also human contact needs, but which the IT, of course, can support. Yeah, I think this yeah. is the idea of multi-channel services, Precisely, which is still, yeah. still valid. I'm glad that you mentioned the public access to the public sector information, and Estonia has a law on that, which hasn't been mentioned today, but I think it's important there is a law which was passed earlier than in the UK, actually. Uh, and uh, that plays an important role, of course. Uh, I think we we'll just give the floor and then uh, Phil, yeah. Uh, well, uh, your experience? <coughs> your experience is really impressive. I like to thanks that you share it f with us. And I'd like to ask any special issue that is how do you manage to involve the private sector with the public to share this? Uh, challenges. Okay, uh, how you. do we do that? Uh, well, I think the private sector is very interested because uh, it uh, gets some of the taxpayers' money then, so uh, why wouldn't they? It's just that uh, I guess the trick is that um, what, what I've, uh, when I compare Estonia's experience with some other countries, uh, we, have, we are not kind of afraid of the private sector. Uh, especially, um, I think uh, President uh, Ilves mentioned it uh, in his speech uh, that uh, we had very sort of, I mean, I know it's a very unpopular topic today uh, to have positive experiences with banks, but we did. <laughs> Um, in back in 1990s, I mean, uh, uh, we started uh, uh, we started uh, e-banking basically 1996 or, or, or around that time, and uh, and people got used to banks uh, providing new services, interesting services. People trusted uh, their money to the banks, and later, for example, when we talk about uh, how we also uh, went over and started to uh, do the internet voting, and people said, okay, um, I trusted my money with banks, they didn't steal it, I mean, it didn't get lost in uh, cyberspace, so we could do the same with, uh, with our votes. And uh, I mean, it's kind of uh, this type of relationship. We had actually uh, positive experiences from private sector, and that's uh, um, uh, how it started. Thank you. Can I offer one suggestion? Spend a lot of time thinking about the incentives that you can provide people to use the services and get online. I'll give you one small example. I did a lot of work in the late 1990s with the Australian Health Service of trying to, to move them online and so on. And the biggest problem we had was the pharmacist. The pharmacist, if you think about it, they're all ordering prescriptions, they're the same prescriptions, it's a unified payment system, et cetera, et cetera. You would think that that would be really easy to do, right? Well, the pharmacist in Australia had sort of a rugged individualist culture of small business and fighting the government. and so. We spent a lot of time, and we said to them, what is your biggest complaint about the government? Not about online or anything else. What was your biggest complaint? Well, the bastards don't pay us on time. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, what about this? If we provide you with access to, to the online system, we'll pay your bills within two weeks. Ninety-seven percent signed up in a month because we gave them the right incentive. And, and actually we created it. We said if we don't, I forgot what the number was, if we don't pay you in three weeks, we'll double the invoice. Well, that was a small fee that the government ended up paying to some people to save millions. So spend a lot of time thinking about what is the incentives, not for you, but for them. <coughs> if, 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 and uh, yes, I would like to. Yeah, a quick comment in answer to, to your question. But look at World Foundation. It's a fascinating example of businesses collaborating 
for public good and their own good, as if our set implementation, it wasn't any charitable work, they needed more customers. They ran out of customers. All internet users were already the customers. <coughs> and they managed to overcome the problem of collective action, get together, put the money together, successfully implement it, contributing to what where Estonia is at the moment. I don't know how you achieved this, how you have enough trust, culture of collaboration, uh, problem of free riding, how you get around this, but they managed to do this. So that's an interesting example. Yeah, we only, we, yeah, always have to think about usability. That's the secret. Um, how to encourage usability. Because without usability, you have a solution, you have an e-government which nobody wants to use. We've seen from Ivar's um, presentation today that 98% of people using the tax rebate system here. Why? Because if you don't use it, you'll get your money back in three or, or six months. Right. But if you use it, you get your money back in five days. Maternity leaves or maternity um, uh, allowances, uh, it has to be done through the portal. There is no way you cannot avoid if you, if, if you want to apply for, for these benefits. So who's using the maternity uh, uh, you know, uh, services? Usually uh, young people between you know, the age of having birth children. So they have no other way but to go through these portals to get. Uh, so, so we have to think about usability. Not only usability. One thing we do when we go to all the countries in Africa or the Middle East or even uh, East uh, Europe uh, or CIS countries is the laws. Uh, it's not only building a solution, but we have to change it. I mean, uh, for example, voting. Uh, you will find in all of our countries, voting, you have to be there in person with an ID in front of somebody unsigned. The laws have to change to accept things digitally. So we, we don't only think about the solution, we think about the usability, how we can not encourage, but even motivate people and block them from using any other roads, but to use this, and uh, off you go. And we have the experience, and if you want, uh, I can give you huge studies on how to make people use it. So I we mean, can just add gun. incentives and uh, usability yeah. as enforcement mechanisms. That's, that's important. Uh, gentlemen over there, you have a comment. My name is Dong Zhe from uh, Macau, China. I would like to ask you and also learn more behind developing uh, e-government. So right now, you got the big achievements, so everybody appreciate it very much. What I'm asking is, in order to implement e-government, such a big project, I'm sure you certainly have already done the overall or global design for carry such a big project. In global design or overall design, you have to describe clearly every requirements, technically and specifically, and also uh, the functionality uh, you have to describe. The problem, my doubt is, by the time going on, something changed. And also, when you see the real developed system, suddenly you find that here, maybe not so suitable. That's why it's better to change something. So everything always keep changing. Never have the time you fixed everything certified. Besides, by the time going on, some new technology also occurred. For example, at the beginning, client server seems good. Then cluster, then now goes to the cloud computing. Maybe tomorrow is uh, something else. So how do you involve those up-to-date, new developed uh, technology into such kind of design or implementation? The problem, I as a developer of e-government system, I fear very painful. Because many times we think this is endless development. So we suffer a lot while you celebrate and uh, enjoy the achievements. As the developer, we sometimes feel very painful. Yeah, that's my question. So, so who can answer the question of this virtuous or vicious circle of technology change? Ajit. Maybe, okay. maybe I'll say okay. one quick word uh, how it is because I didn't uh, have a chance to explain it. If uh, you looked and you, again I invite you to go to the other room to see this uh, X road, how it is built up. But uh, this uh, is an open-ended process. 
The trick is, when we started it in 2002, or we launched it, I mean, we didn't uh, say that, okay, the project, as usual, the project starts at the date X, then it uh, continues a uh, year, two year, whatever, and then it finishes. And then people say, okay, it was successful or it wasn't successful. We didn't really design it to be a closed process. We just said, okay, uh, it is successful already when we have uh, uh, three first big databases to talk to each other. So that is how it went. And now there are, uh, uh, well, four years ago, there were over 100 different uh, data systems uh, talking to each other. We started with the government databases. Now the private sector can also accede uh, uh, to this exchange uh, if they follow the same data protection rules as the government does. So the way to do it really. Uh, and the trick how we uh, succeeded in a way was that uh, we had this kind of uh, relaxed sort of way of uh, thinking, okay, we'll do this, and it is open process. I mean, there is nothing to do about it. Uh, so in that sense, we didn't feel a failure. I mean, it wasn't uh, that, okay, we didn't finish a project now, uh, we have to postpone the launch of it for another half a year or something, give us more money. No, that wasn't the case. So that is, and, and what is uh, uh, today? Either yeah. is the development by yourself or after source. What I'm talking is after source. If you sign contract with some uh, companies, then you meet trouble. Or company will suffer a lot. Well, That's uh, the problem. Uh, if you develop it by yourself, no, I, I never understand mind. what you are saying. Uh, the procurement rules uh, certainly um, have to be also tinkered with uh, to, to get there where we want to go. And uh, procurement of IT, is, uh, IT uh, systems is altogether a very big issue and very important issue. But what I wanted to say maybe, and would uh, sort of contribute here as well, uh, this uh, talk about the cloud, about the t centralization and what is now uh, going on uh, uh, pretty much in the world community of e-governance. Estonian X-Road example is a very good way uh, for the countries uh, um, uh, that have coalition governments, that have uh, political problems. See, if politicians hear the words of, uh, okay, we centralize, that means somebody gets something and somebody has to give it away. This X-Road solution leaves a power sort of uh, arrangement as they were. And that is very important uh, to, ga to gain this kind of uh, positive uh, support from the politicians. So you do it uh, this kind of uh, decentralized way, you leave it as an open process, and uh, success is around the corner. Thank you. Yeah, just to add a small thing. What you said is absolutely correct. If you are going to get some other company to do it for you, you're dead. Okay, if you buy a car from Mars, you have to have a guy from Mars to service that car. So uh, that is something which has happened. And that's why I've mentioned uh, here in Estonia, they've used open source. And what we are implementing, not only in Estonia, but even outside of Estonia, we are imp implementing the building of IT industry where we actually export uh, the know-how on how to build, how to support, how to develop. And it's very easy. I mean, we have a saying which says, uh, needs is a mother of invention. Uh, I will give you something very, very quickly today. You have realized it also in Estonia. Uh, just a few years ago, I mean, just around the corner, we have developed the ID cards with the SIM card and the digital signature on it. And it was very nice, and everybody is happy, and everybody is thinking of doing the same. Now we are going to stop doing that. Why? Because it is very expensive to do ID cards with SIM card in it and digital signature. I cannot sell that in Africa. Okay, I mean, a SIM card in an ID card, if a citizen has to buy it, that means probably three times his salary, or four times his salary, six months' salary. So now we decided, okay, let's go digital signature on mobile. Every person in Africa has two mobiles, okay? <laughs> let's do it some from the mobile. So now ID cards are not going to be chipped anymore. Yet people are still talking about chipped mobile, and that is the innovation. This is the need and invention, cost, need and invention. 
So we always have to keep our mind open. This is not, not nuclear physics, by the way, IT. Even a Sudanese guy could do it. So I mean, <laughs> we have no problem here. <laughs> OK? So uh, practically speaking, always think of building your IT industry, not implementation of solutions. Implementation of solution is easy. Build the IT industry around implementation of your solution. So it's that's how you have to say. So it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. Yeah, I just, yeah. Just before to proceed, I would like that we'd like to conclude in about five minutes because we started later. So probably there will be just just time for two, three maximum contributions. So yeah, please. Здравствуйте, Бахтер Мамин, Таджикистана. У меня такой вот, я вижу, что дискуссия идет насчет частного сектора. Я сам представитель частного сектора и хотел бы вот сказать, вопрос задавали, как стимулировать частный сектор. У нас нет трансляции по-другому. I just, I just can, I just can translate to the presenter that how you sort of uh, encourage the private sector to be part of those initiatives. That's the question. Probably we've been addressing that question, but if just mm -hmm. very quick remark on that. Uh, so what Ever has been mentioned in pub mm -hmm. public-private partnerships, probably one of the solutions. <coughs> what else uh, do we have? A я извиняюсь, я не, не говорю по-английски, поэтому mm -hmm. а, вот я говорю, что основным заинтересованными э, лицами для перехода в электронное правительство это является частный сектор. Про Таджикистан говорили, что да, да действительно уровень коррупции очень большой. Ну, эта коррупция создается бедностью, бедность не дает э, коррупция не дает, чтобы страна стала богатой. И вот этот замкнутый цикл, он никак не выр... трудно вырваться оттуда. Вы, наверное, слышали про э, телекоммуникационный бомб в Таджикистане, и э, очень много частных компаний далеко вперед ушли, а государственный сектор очень э, медленно начал развиваться. И вот эти э, бумажные технологии, которые как бы манипулировать для того, чтобы э, именно коррупционные схемы развивать. И сам государственный орган не заинтересован модернизироваться, чтобы стать более прозрачным. <coughs> Поэтому мы очень заинтересованы, частный сектор, чтобы нас даже не нужно стимулировать, чтобы мы это делали. Просто, может быть, надо объяснить, что вот это электронное правительство, оно и позволит лучше бизнесу развиваться. I got it wrong. Actually, the question was that the private sector doesn't need any encouragement. They, they're ready to. And in Tajikistan, the telecom has been booming. But the problem is that the public sector, the government, is very slow. And they're probably interested in keeping the status quo because paperwork uh, encourages corruption. And how to break this uh, vicious circle that the, the government actually starts doing something? That's the question, is I correctly? И yeah, хотелось бы спросить, может быть, и есть какой-то именно рецепт, как это преодолеть? Э, потому что, ну, азиатские страны, они особо менталитетно немножко другой, чем, например, европейские, да? И вот э, о, э, мне понравилось выступление господина, который в азиатских странах э, электронное правительство делает. И э, если есть какой-то рецепт, нам бы это было бы очень полезно. Мы всячески поддерживаем развитие и стимулируем, чтобы это быстрее в Таджикистане произошло. So the private sector Tajikistan Спасибо. believes that the government can actually reduce corruption and make change in that, but uh, uh, they're interested in, in the receipt, in the receipt. So what was the receipt for that? So, can, of course, it's very difficult to 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 provide one answer, but uh, if you can just uh, Uh, provide a, a quick answer. If, is there any receipt? <laughs> I would say just receipt. look at Egypt, Libya, any, any Syria. Syria. <laughs> any, just look at Egypt, yeah. Libya, and Syria. Any solution? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so the, there, that. is, there is a solution, but not in a government uh, yeah. arena. So yes, решение, но не not in, in government. So well, this is of course a question, uh, an issue which we been discussing the whole session and probably at other sessions also, uh, my, my answer would be that there is no one solution, no one sort of receipt to how to do it, but uh, your, my, your sort of point is correct that the private sector and the public sector have to cooperate and this is one of the lessons which Estonia is ready to provide and probably even uh, explain what is the machinery between Uh, inside this cooperation, why the private sector is interested and, and, and why the government is supporting those private sector initiatives, like look at world, for example. 
So this is, uh, uh, understand there will be, yeah. okay, that's just two questions. I? Very quick, no, no, so no. Tajikistan, yeah, again. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> my question to Mr. Noble and uh, Mr. Lab Labudi. Yeah, that's right, Majid. Uh, yes. Um, both uh, you talk about uh, citizens. We've been talking about private public sector, but uh, you, about citizens. And Mr. Noble mentioned about incentives, more incentives to people, and Mr. Labudi more about making people use is uh, e-government services. It reminds me the <coughs> uh, punish and appra appraisal approach. Uh, as um, Professor Hicks, Richard Hicks um, says about providing more incentives makes, might, might make citizens uh, infantive, infantive consumers or infantive citizens of, e uh, of, of public services. But at the same time, making them uh, use the e-services might make them aggressive, aggressive uh, <laughs> users. What is the middle ground so, so that we can have conscious citizen, conscious, consciously using e-services citizen? Thank you. Thank you. I would just like very brief answers because time is running out. I don't think there is a simple answer. But let me make three very, very quick observations that cover your question and the gentleman before. Number one, there's one thing every politician can do. They can count. They can count votes. And if you, if you can create the political environment where it, they want to do it, even if they don't like to do it, if it's a political movement, if, if you get people interested in doing things, they, you, you create the political will. Secondly, never forget the larger audience. In the Arab Spring in Cairo, about half of the, all tweets were in English because they were playing to a larger audience. They were playing to a global audience. They were playing to forces outside of their own country. And we're a global economy, so never forget that ability to play sort of globally. And then the last is, it, if it works and it's good, that's how you build the constituency. That's how you build the numbers. If it doesn't work, even if it's online, it still doesn't work. So the key is to build something simple that works, start small, and build on that success. Thank you very much, Phil. And uh, do we have a final question? Yeah? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Al Badawi. I am from Sudan, so I can understand mobile ID, as the gentleman <laughs> said. But I work for United Arab Emirates e government. Um, I spent the day uh, listening to a speech about uh, e-Estonia. And one of the great things I, I observed is that you have managed to create um, a great balance between planning and implementation of e-government initiatives. <laughs> this helped you to create uh, a consistent long-term vision and implementation. So how did you reach this point? And how this helped you to respond to crises, like financial crisis, for example, 2008? Thank you very much. Oh, well, that was question to me, I guess. Uh, but um, you know what? Uh, I'll, uh, we have another event starting up, and I'll be happy to tell you there. Because uh, we'll have some drinks, we can walk around, we can uh, talk to each other and ask all these questions. Because the answer to your question is rather long. I mean, it's uh, not that easy to create this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and with this I would like to conclude this session and just to remind that another important issue which was mentioned by President that uh, Estonia is a democratic and, and 
and pursuit of democracy is fundamental choice of Estonia and probably this is one of the major reasons why the country has been successful also in deploying ICT for governance. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.